right, well, good morning once more. It's, uh, it's good to be with you. We, um, we've, ha- we've had a lot of stuff going on recently, and it, it just feels like, uh, it feels like Sundays run together nowadays. It's just like Sunday, and then the next day is Sunday, and then the next day is Sunday again. So it's, it's, it's good, though. I, I, I like Sundays. Sunday's my favorite day of the week. And uh, I'm, I'm glad that you are here to worship with us. Uh, I'd like to welcome back uh, our, our travelers from Guatemala. Uh, I don't know if Kathy's in here, too, or not, but Eric... And, and so we're, we're, we're glad that you guys are back and safe and sound and had a good trip and, and all of that. So, um, but we, um, we had a great event yesterday over at our Lancaster campus uh, with the fall festival. And uh, Michelle and her team did a fantastic job putting that all together and making that happen. And for all of you who went from over here, from York, we had a massive show of force uh, from from the York campus, and man, you just don't even understand how much I appreciate that um, and, and your support on all that, that we are doing and that's happening um, with uh, launching the, the Lancaster campus. Pray for us. Today we are changing the music style. Praise the Lord. So uh, pray for uh, Kevin and Winona and, uh, and Danny are leading worship over there this, this morning. And so um, it, it, it's, it, it's good, though. Uh, God, is, God is good and doing some great things. And it's going uh, it, to be an awesome thing. It already is for our church. We are, uh, we are just experiencing new life that God has, uh, has brought to us and and it's, uh, it, it's just fun to be a part of what God's doing, isn't it? It's just fun to be a part of, uh, of, of something that's alive and, and, uh, and breathing and moving. And so uh, today we're going we're gonna to start a new series today. It's uh, called Nehemiah, Building a C3 Life. As you know, we have recently changed our name, and we uh, have recently uh, sort of went through, uh, I say recently because it just kind of come, it, it kind of came to a head and we made the decisions, but the truth is we've been building to this moment for uh, I, three, five, seven years, I don't know how long it's been, that, that God has been moving and transforming and changing us and and into what he wants us to be. And, um, and, and here's the other disclaimer about this, is that as long as we walk with God, we will continue that process. Just because we, uh, you know, have been changed into what we are today does not mean that's what we will be five years from now. Hopefully we won't change the name again five years from now. Uh, we kept the, the, the other name, uh, like uh, York Christian Church, for, what, 37 years or something? So uh, we'll, we'll see. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's more of a process to change a name than we all anticipated. But it's, it's been good, and it represents who we are, uh, Connection Christian Church. And we are about building God's family together. And I'm, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself, but I think it's my next slide, actually. Uh, it, I, I want to I show it to you. There you go. This, this is our purpose statement. And this is, uh, over the years, our purpose statement has kind of uh, transformed and, it, and, it's, and it's evolved, if you will, uh, as we have evolved as a church. How many of you know you can't do ministry the same way forever and expect to be effective? Just like you can't raise a child and treat that child the same way at two years old that you do at 22 years old. It just doesn't work that way, right? And so we have to be willing and, and ready to evolve into what God is, is drawing us, growing us, moving us, uh, developing us to become as we move into the ministry that he has 
put in front of us. And so uh, our purpose statement, just wanted to share that with you uh, again, is Connection Christian Church is building God's family together by helping people connect with God, connect with others, and connect in ministry. That is a very important thing to know as a, as a part of Connection Christian Church. As a part of this church, you have to know that everything that we do is to, is to reach one of those connection points and to, uh, to, to get, to make that connection. And if we do that, then I believe that God has led us to a place that where if we will do that, if we will simply focus on that, those three connection points, then we will become what God has created us to be what God has drawn us together to be. And so it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a freeing thing, actually. It, it's, a very, it, it's a very simplified way of doing church as our church gets more complicated. Does that make sense? Uh, it, it's a way uh, for our church to be smaller as we grow larger. Okay? Is, is, so I, I want to just rehearse with you, though, quickly. Uh, today is, is kind of a CCC 101 for you uh, to, to just kind of get you oriented in who we are as a church. If this is your first time here, then it's a great Sunday to be here. So we're, we're going to the basics. And, but uh, if you've been here for a long, long time, that, it's a great time to be here, too, because we all need to be reminded of this constantly as we as we grow through this. So uh, our core values uh, really grew out of something that, that myself and the elders went through many, many years ago to really sit down and think about what is it that we are about? Like what drives us? What makes us a church? Why are we here? And, and so we, we thought about what is it that we value so much that if we don't accomplish these things, then we are not doing what God has called us to do. And so we came up with this little house metaphor uh, because of the building God's family together thought process. We, we, we came up this house. I, I didn't pull out the, the cheesy old PowerPoint that I made years ago when I had no idea how to make PowerPoints. But, but, but there is a PowerPoint that, that brings this all together. But just here's the list that we are building on a foundation of worship that everything that we do in the service, outside of the service, in our homes, as, as we just do life, uh, we are doing it as unto the Lord, as an act of worship. And so when, you are, when you're part of the CCC family, living the C3 life, that means that you're going to be living as a worshiper of God wherever, whenever you are. Does that make sense? We don't just worship inside these walls. We worship with our lives all the time. We are opening doors into God's family. I, I mean, I, I don't mean to, I don't want to sound critical or, or negative uh, right off the bat, but how many of you know this, that sometimes us Christians are our own worst enemies? Like we give, we give unbelievers lots and lots and lots of excuses to not want to be one of us. You, you know what I'm saying? We don't want to be that. We want to be an open door into God's family. We don't want to be an obstacle. We want to be a gateway into God's family. And we want to live our lives in a way that causes people to want to come follow our God. How does Jesus say we do that? We do that by loving one another. You will know that they are my disciples because of the way they love one another. Not because of the way they bicker at one another. Or because of the way that they complain and gripe about everything at one another right? But because of the way that they love one another. Listen, if we could just be a group of people that love each other as hard as we can, we will have to turn people away to be able to fit it all in. Because this world is so desperate for someone to just love them and accept them, and embrace them. Now listen, when we accept people, it doesn't mean that we accept their sin, right, or their behavior. What it means is we accept them as sinners who need help, who need recovery, who need the truth and the word of God that has set us free so that it can set them free as well. And we bring 
good news, right? The gospel is good news. It's not news to beat people about the head and shoulders. It is good news that as far down as you think you are, the long arm of the Lord is long enough to reach you wherever you may be. That's the gospel. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter where you've been. What matters is God's grace covers it all. God's grace is the trump card. It covers everything. And when we are willing to just embrace that grace and share the love, allow God's love to flow through us, it's a part of our DNA that everything that comes to us flows through us to the world around us. We are held up by learning and living the Word of God. We believe in Scripture. We believe that Scripture is inerrant in its original form. We believe that Scripture is the final authority on all things that, that we call life. And we believe that Scripture was given to us to reveal to us who God is and His heart for us. And we are wired for service inside and outside the church. We are wired. God has created us to be fulfilled when we are serving others. I, I, I was talking to someone re recently, and, and um, he, he, he mentioned, uh, at, when, I'm, when I'm serving others, I don't have time to worry about my own junk. I was like, that's awesome. That person's here. You know who I'm talking about. I'm not going to look at you. But you know what I'm talking about. When I'm, when I'm serving others, when I'm trying to meet other people's needs, I am not worried about my own selfish needs. But in the meeting of other people's needs, somehow my needs get met. It's just an amazing thing that God is able to do. And then finally, we are covered with a responsibility to reach our world. We have a mission. We have a purpose. We talk about that all the time around here because I, I, one of my greatest fears in, 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 uh, as, it, as it, the church goes is that we have lost a sense of our mission, that we are called to go into all the world and make disciples, that we are to love them into the kingdom. So we call this living the C3 life. And this is kind of new language for us around here, so you'll, you'll, you'll hear it often, uh, hopefully. And um, so as, as you've heard many times, we believe that the church is called to make connections. We changed our name to reflect this. Today we're beginning this series uh, on portions of the book of Nehemiah that will not only illustrate but demonstrate this way of life, and I believe that this way of life has been the way that God has been doing things for thousands and thousands of years. So this is nothing new, but this is something that I think that we have to come into. Using the book of Nehemiah, we're going to focus uh, on, on each of these connection points. And today and next week, we're going to talk about connecting with God. Connecting with God. Today's sermon is called Power Prayer. And the point that I want to get to is prayer is what connects us to our power source for purpose, endurance, and favor. Why do you pray? Why do you pray is a, is a, is a huge question. Do you pray out of obligation? Do you pray out of, do you only pray when it's a desperation prayer? Listen, I believe in desperation prayers. I live on desperation prayer. God, help me, you know? I mean, the greatest prayer that I think is ever recorded in the Bible outside of Jesus' prayer uh, when he taught us how to pray is Peter's prayer when he is sinking in the water after walking on water and he takes his eyes off Jesus and looks at the waves and he begins to sink. And what does he say? Save me. I think that is an awesome prayer. I think we need to pray those kind of prayers every day. And, and the beauty of praying a desperation prayer is understanding the fact that he is right there within arm's reach all the time. And, and, and that's why we can pray those prayers. But the question is, why do we pray? Why do we pray? 
What is the reason? I, I think these three things here help to focus us, and we're going to look at this through the book of Nehemiah to find our purpose. We just went through a, a whole series called Kazon, and, and, it, and it was all about finding the vision that God has for our lives, finding the purpose that God has for us to be here. And, and, I, and I know that many of you have, have worked through that diligently and have discovered some incredible things, and, and, and I encourage you to keep working through that. Keep looking at that. Keep reviewing and praying about that because God just wants to continue to reveal things to us. But as we move forward, we're going to see that it's in this, in prayer, it's in our connection with God that we find the, the purpose and the endurance to hang on, to keep going, to keep moving forward, and we find the favor. And I love this, I love the idea of finding favor when it comes from God because it is this favor that opens doors that are otherwise closed. It changes things, it shifts things quickly. A little history before we dive into the book of Nehemiah. If you want to turn in your Bibles or iPhones or in wherever you can get Nehemiah, you're, you're welcome to. We'll be in chapter 1. Uh, Nehemiah, the story of Nehemiah begins uh, about a thousand years after Moses led the people out of slavery and into Egypt, about 1446 B.C.-ish, right? About 590 years after David defeated Goliath, about 160 years after Daniel was put into exile in Babylon and 141 years after Jeremiah prophesied the destruction of Jerusalem. This destruction was going to come as God used their enemies to judge them for their rejection of him. About 13 years after Ezra led a second group of exiles back to Judah, and the books of Ezra and Nehemiah basically function like one book. They're two key parts of the same story. Ezra tells how the temple was rebuilt. And Nehemiah shares how the city walls were rebuilt. And it's in this rebuilding of the kingdom. It's in this rebuilding of Jerusalem and the city of God that, that we get to relate to this because the truth is in those days when they thought of Jerusalem and the temple they thought the kingdom of God when we look around at our world because of what Christ has done because of the Holy Spirit in us we live in the kingdom of God always and so everything that we get to rebuild around us is a part of that kingdom so every day we are building God's family together. We are building the kingdom of God. And, and, and there are principles in Nehemiah that help us to, to understand how to move toward that. So in Nehemiah chapter 1, beginning of verse 1, I'm just going to unpack this a little bit because it's, uh, it's primarily a prayer, and, and that's what we want to get to. In the words of Nehemiah, son of Hecala, or whatever, in the Month of Keshlev, the twelfth year, in the twelfth year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hananiah, one of my brothers, came to Judah with some other, with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. Jerusalem had been exile, it was the Persian era, uh, had, had completely destroyed uh, Jerusalem, and, and all the people were taken off into distant lands. The Jewish people have always been scattered because of the rejection of God. Uh, this, this has happened. So they said to me, in verse 3, they said to me, those who survived the exile are back in the province and are in great trouble and distress. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. 
That verse 4 right there is the one that we need to really latch on to and really uh, think about for, for a minute. What happened to Nehemiah at this moment? Nehemiah was the cupbearer to the king. He was, uh, he was in a he was in a palace. He, he had good food to eat. He had all the, all the creature comforts that could be afforded to someone. Even as a servant, he lived sort of like a king. And so he, he was in a good place. But something happened to him when his brother came to town and told him what was going on in Jerusalem. Something snapped in Nehemiah's heart. We're going to call that a burden. A burden snapped. A burden hit Nehemiah's heart like a ton of bricks. And the burden of a calling and a vision from God can do that to you. When all of a sudden you have a burden, a a ton of bricks that falls down on you because that is what God created you for, because that is your kazon, that is why you are here, one of the many or the primary one, that is when you all of a sudden are crushed under the weight of a burden from God and the only thing that can lift that off of you is to fulfill what God has called you to. So I I just want to talk to you a couple of things about a burden. A a burden is a God-given concern to meet a need or make something happen. Have you ever had that where God just puts something in front of you and for some reason it doesn't seem to affect anyone else around you, but for some reason it just crushes you? It just plows you under, and you can't think about anything else. It just consumes you. Listen, we need to pay attention to those things. Those things reveal purpose. Those things reveal where our passion is. It reveals to us what it is that God is calling us and raising us up to do and to be. A burden will get you up early and keep you up late at night. A burden will change everything. I'll use you. your illustration, Paul. Paul just told me this morning, he woke up, like what, 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock, something like that? 4.30? I was, I was almost right. <laughs> thinking about lights, thinking about how to light the stage, to light the building for the worship night that's coming up and for the Lancaster campus and for this campus and for the new building and, and all of that. Listen, Did anybody else wake up thinking about lights this morning? I sure hope not. But but, but here's the thing. Paul has been called to that. He has been called to production of, to make what happens here look good so that we can eliminate distractions and so that you can hear the message of the Word of God. How many of you think, I mean, there's nothing spiritual about hanging and turning on lights and getting them on at the right time, right place. But how many of you know you will be completely distracted from the spiritual if they are not there? If you can't see or if they're flashing in weird ways and times, you will be completely distracted. The greatest thing that can happen is for someone like him to have a burden to say, I want this to look good so people are not distracted from the message of the Word of God, from, from what God has brought to us. What is your burden? It, it might be something that sounds spiritual and it might be something that doesn't at all, but the truth is, whatever it is that we offer to God makes it holy. Holy. How do you consecrate anything? You give it to God. Once you lay anything on the altar and say, God, here is what I can do. Here is what you have created me to be able to do. Here is how I think. Here here are my spiritual gifts. Here are my experiences. Here is my education. Here is my energy. When you lay that on the altar before God, it becomes holy. It becomes sanctified at that moment. The way that you took a sacrifice out of the field, a, 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 a sheep out in the field was just a sheep but when you took that sheep and brought it to the altar of God and you laid it on the altar all of a sudden that became a holy sacrifice that's how we become living sacrifices 
holy and pleasing to God, Romans 12. By laying ourselves on the altar before him and saying, here I am, Lord, use me. A burden is from the heart, not the head. Sometimes a burden don't even make any sense at all. Sometimes you're like, why do I even care about this? Like, why is this bothering me so bad? Why is this bugging? It doesn't make any sense for me to wake up at 4.30 in the morning and be thinking about this. But it's because it's from the heart where God speaks to us, not from the head where we get in the way. A burden will change your prayer life from something nice to do to something that you can't survive without. Listen, when your prayer life becomes a a full-on desperation for survival, that's some good praying right there. That's that's where prayer begins to to make a difference. When, When you have been called, when you have been burdened to the point where you are willing to stop eating, where you're willing to stop... To, to stop sleeping, where you are, uh, can't stop the tears from flowing because it is pouring out of you so violently, that is where prayer begins to matter. That's where it begins to happen. Now, I'm not saying that you have to pray like that all the time. So you can praise the Lord. You can be happy in prayer, absolutely. But when God crushes you with a, with a burden, it will drive you to your knees. And that burden will cause you to forget about other things that distract you throughout the day. This is what happened to Nehemiah. Nehemiah goes on to record his prayer. He says this in verse 5, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servant for your servants the people of Israel Nehemiah is crying out in desperation to God it's important that we remind ourselves who God is and what he has promised he doesn't forget but sometimes we do you read a prayer like this, and Nehemiah is telling God who God is, right? He's telling God who he is and what he's promised. But listen, that promise is, we're not, we're not reminding God of anything. We are proclaiming and reminding ourselves. When we proclaim what, God, what he has done, it builds and strengthens our faith and our resolve. When we remind ourselves of who God is, Because listen, the world can get overwhelming and we can begin to look around and see the world and say, oh, the problems are so big, the the enemy is so strong, this and that, you know, everything is crushing in, everything is coming down, everything's falling apart. But God, there you go, but God has a plan, but God is bigger, but God is stronger, God will not fail. And when we are willing to rise up and proclaim that in our prayer life, in our own little private worship services, we begin to proclaim the promises of God and claim the power of God that he has promised to us, then we can change things by the way that we pray. He has given us access to the power source. And, and if, if we are willing to plug in to that power source, then he will download it into us because he is that kind of God and that's what he has promised. Verse 6, second part of verse 6 says, I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have We have acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. You see, he all of a sudden became very keenly aware of his sin and the sins of his people. And it is that sin of his people that drove him to what I believe the most powerful thing in the Christian life is confession. Confession is the most powerful weapon that we have against the enemy because it positions us in a place of humility where we can be delivered by the Lord's mighty hand. Confession gets us out of the way and turns the battle over to the Lord. 
Confession, listen, if pride can be used by the enemy to destroy you, which is what the Bible says, pride goes before the fall, confession is the opposite of pride. Confession is when I'm willing to drop to my knees and say, Lord, I've blown it here. Lord, I'm not strong enough here. Lord, I, I, I messed this all up. I have missed the mark completely here, Lord. But listen, here's a promise you can put in the bank. It's 1 John 1.9. Many of you probably know it by heart. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. How much unrighteousness? All unrighteousness. When we confess our sin, when we come before God not acting like we are God, not acting like we've got it going on, not acting like we have somehow earned our way into his presence, but confessing our sin, coming clean before God, laying it out bare before him, not pretending that we're hiding from the all-seeing, all-knowing God, then we are in a position where God can step in and fix things, where he can make things happen. And listen, he is faithful and he is justified. That word just there is shortened from justified. He is the only one who is justified to do anything about sin. Why? Because he died for it. He is the one who paid the price. He is the one who went and paid the bill at the judge's office. And he is the one that can turn around and say, now you're forgiven. Now you're set free. Now you have no penalty against you. He is justified to do that. Nehemiah, 8, Nehemiah 1 verse 8 goes on to say, Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if, you, even if your exiled people are at the furthest horizon, I will gather them. From there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. We serve a God of restoration. He restores his people. We serve a God who is full of grace and his grace is evident throughout scripture. We, we sometimes think of the Old Testament as a, a judgment way, you know, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth and full of judgment and harsh, a harsh God. And somehow in the New Testament, he changed to this nice, cushy, you know, user-friendly God. And I'm going to tell you right now that the Bible is true, that God does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. The same God of grace that we celebrate today is the the God of grace that was in the Old Testament. But uh, the flip side of that is true. The same God of judgment that we see in the Old Testament is the same God of judgment that will not stand for sin because it put his son on the cross and he will not stand for it. If we will return to him, we will find he never went anywhere. We are prone to wonder, as the old hymn says, prone to leave this God I love. We must continually remind, be reminded of the mercy and grace of God. Why do you think I talk about grace so much all the time? Because it is the only reason that I'm here. It's the only reason that I'm here. I'm saved by grace. It is by grace that I am saved. Period. The end. There's nothing that I had to bring to the table. It is fully by grace. But God says, if you will return to me, Nehemiah reminds him, if you will return to me and obey my commands, Malachi tells us a similar thing, a God speaking through the prophet. Malachi says this in verse uh, Malachi 3, 7, Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord. How many of you know that that is a statement of grace? God is fully justified in that moment in saying, ever since this and that, you did not keep my decrees, you did not keep my laws, and therefore I am going to crush you. 
And he would have been completely justified in doing so. But instead, his grace comes through and his grace says, return to me. Come home. Return to me. And I will, re and I will return to you. It's, it's beautifully illustrated in Luke 15 in the prodigal son's very common story. The father sees his son walk away with his inheritance to go squander and waste it away. He had no reason to let him come back home. He was completely justified in rejecting that son who took his inheritance and went away and squandered it and, re and, and considered him dead. The son considered the father dead by taking his inheritance early. And still yet, when the son repented, when the son returned to him, the father was there waiting and returned to him. And he put a robe on his back and a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and he restored him to his sonship. That's the beauty of grace. That's what God has given to us. Verse 10 of Nehemiah's prayer says, They are your servants and your people who you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayers of those, uh, uh, to the prayer of this, your servant, and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. This man was the king. He was a tyrant. He was an evil man. He was a man that had crushed basically the whole world up to this point. And now Nehemiah is standing before God or laying before God on his face and crying out and saying, Now God, give me favor in the face of this tyrant. All success and favor comes from the Lord. He will grant what we need when we pursue his will according to his plan and purpose. Here's a great promise to hold on to. We, if you don't have it memorized, you need to memorize it. Romans 8, 28, And we know that in all things God works for, works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to what? His purpose. Listen, if you are about your purpose you don't have any reason to call on the Lord because you're still the king of your own kingdom. You're still the God of your own uh, whatever that would be. You are still in charge, right? You follow? But when we are willing to humble ourselves before the mighty hand of God, when we are willing to lay all of us down on the altar and say, here I am, Lord, send me, that is when... That is when we can call upon the name of the Lord because of his purpose. That is when we can walk with confidence into a situation that is surely going to be absolute, a death sentence. For Nehemiah to talk to the king about restoring an enemy city was a, like a death sentence to him. And still yet, Nehemiah cries out and prays. For favor. And we will see through this, through this story that God grants it in ways that no one could have ever predicted. And then finally it says, I was the cupbearer to the king. Listen, God has you in the right place. God has you right where he wants you and where he needs you to accomplish his purpose. Wherever you are, you might, you might think, I, you don't know what kind of darkness I work in. Listen, you are in that darkness on purpose because the light never shines brighter than in a dark room. You are in that darkness. There is no separation. There is no difference between sacred and, and secular, right? 
When you are a worshiper, we are building on a foundation of worship. When you are a worshiper of God, you are a worshiper not just on Sunday morning for an hour or two, but you are a worshiper 24-7, all the year long, every single day. You are living as a sacrifice before God according to His plan and His purpose, and He is empowering you to be able to do what He's called you to do. And it's in that life that you will experience true life. That you will experience the true power that, it, that comes from knowing who he is. We are here to build the kingdom of God and do God's will on earth as it is in heaven. Just as Nehemiah was burdened by a calling and vision, God has the same in store for us if we will commit to his will. If we will simply commit to it and say, Lord, here we are. Here we are. Let us build the kingdom. Let us be a part of this calling. Let us be a part of what you have done here, what you are doing. Where you are is the place from which God has positioned you to start. This is the first day of the rest of your life. It's the first day of fulfilling the rest of the calling that God has for you for your days. I want to quickly just go through four things, four steps that you could write down. You, yeah, we left you some, some room to write down if you're taking notes. Four steps to committing to your burden. Number one, identify what God has made you sensitive to. Pay attention to what it is that God has made your heart break for. What is it that gets you up early and keeps you up late at night? What, what, what is it that, 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 that surprises you how much you care about it? That is a clue to what God is doing in your life. Number two, pray. No, I mean really pray. I, I mean really pray for real, right? Spend some time locked in prayer. Spend some time, like in, the, like in the Old Testament, grab hold of that angel. Grab hold of the angel of the Lord and don't let it go. Don't let it go. If it pops your hip out of joint, so be it. Just keep praying. Just keep holding on. Keep contending in prayer. Number three, remind yourself of who God is and what God has done. Here's just some verses that I think would be worth going back and just reviewing. Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God who works in you to will and to, to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. It is God who works in you to do these things. When we are willing to let God have his way. Acts 17 basically says that from one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth and he marked out their appointed time in history and their boundaries of their, listen, you are here right now, right where you are because God put you here. That's what the word of God says. It is no accident that you are here. You are here because he chose you and he chose to put you here and he created you and he had a plan for you from the very beginning. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him though he is not far from any one of us. That's good news. When we reach out for God we will find that he's just right there. He's right there. Esther is a very familiar passage we quote all the time. For such a time as this, you were put here. Number four, ask for favor from the Lord and that you might glorify him through your life. Here's what Jesus said about that. In John 17, he said, I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. How much more could we do than Jesus does if we could just simply finish the work that God has called us to do? Listen, church, this is very important. Hear what I'm saying. You are a part of something bigger than you. I'm a part of something bigger than I am. We are in this thing together. 
And, and we are called to this place for this time, for this moment, for such a time as this, to make a difference in the kingdom that will last for all eternity. We have to take it seriously. We have to believe. And we have to pray. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the vision, the burden, the kazon that you give us in our lives. Lord, we pray that you would bring us to life in our souls and our spirits, that you would ignite something in us that would cause us to get up early and stay up late. Lord, we pray that you would help us to uh, experience the power of, of knowing that you have a plan, that you have a reason for us to be here. And Lord, as we worship you this morning, as we stand and sing, as we take communion together as a family, as we bring our offering, Lord, it's all an act of worship to just exalt your mighty name. And so, Lord, we pray right now that you would be glorified that you would be lifted up as we commit ourselves to such a time as this, Lord, use us. Here we are. Send us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.